Debate the Honourable Member for, member for Elmswood Transcona. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And if I could, I just want to take a moment to say thank you once again to the constituents of uh, Elma Transcona for having placed their trust in me to represent them in this place. To say thank you to my wife, uh, Janelle, and our children, Robert and Noah, who support me in my parliamentary service, as well as all of our family, friends, and the many volunteers that contributed to, uh, to my being here today, Mr. Speaker. What I find interesting about this bill and the, and the topic of pandemic supports is that I think it speaks to the kind of dual crossroads, if you will, that, or the crossroads simply that Canada finds itself in in the face of two great challenges. On the one hand, there's the challenge of pandemic recovery, and on the other, there's the challenge of the climate crisis, because they both raise similar questions, questions of how to support workers that suddenly see their industry dramatically hurt by forces beyond their control. They'll both raise the question of how to support vulnerable people that aren't able to work through times of crisis and the economic effects of those crises, like inflation, as an example. They both raise the question of how to direct investment in infrastructure and services in a way that make us more resilient against the challenges we face. <clears throat> and they both raise the questions of how we decide who should pay the cost of these investments and what are the mechanisms by which those payments ought to be made. These are just some of the important questions that the pandemic and the climate crisis both raise. Getting the pandemic recovery right is important, certainly in its own right, Mr. Speaker, but I wanted to begin on that note just with a reminder that these are not questions that are going to be over with the pandemic, but these are questions that we're going to continue to face in the years to come as the climate crisis worsens. The Liberals have been very clear in introducing this bill that as far as they're concerned, we're turning the page on the pandemic. If you look around, though, it's quite clear that we're not past the pandemic. In fact, I heard many Liberal members yesterday in the debate about a hybrid parliament make arguments about how we aren't past the pandemic and how the effects of the pandemic and the imperatives of the pandemic still very much rule our life. And certainly, if you look around at um, different parts of the country, you can see that, in fact, we're in a fourth wave. And even when the public health crisis has passed, Mr. Speaker, I think it's quite reasonable to expect that the economic consequences of the pandemic will extend past the end of the public health crisis and take longer to resolve. Earlier this week, the Deputy Prime Minister said that Canada has recovered all the jobs lost during the pandemic, and it may indeed be the case that that statistic is true in terms of the number of jobs out there that are available. But it's also true that the unemployment rate is almost at 7%. It's also true that the inflation rate is over 4%, and that employers are complaining about a labour shortage. So what do all those numbers mean? We often throw figures and statistics out in this place um, and without really kind of getting to the core of what those numbers mean for people across the country. They mean that there's many Canadians looking for work but they're not the Canadians with the skills, the education, and the experience that their employers are looking right now for their business, because otherwise they would find it a lot easier to get that job, and more employers would be satisfied that they can find workers. It means that even as this mismatch in the labour market is frustrating employers and keeping Canadians who want a job unemployed, both people and businesses are facing rising costs after depleting all of their reserves trying to cope with the economic disruptions of the pandemic. These numbers mean that it's absolutely not the time for the federal government to turn its back on the people who need help the most. And yet, this is the direction that Bill C-2 takes us, Mr. Speaker. New Democrats have been very clear that we believe the Canada recovery benefit should have been maintained for the time being and restored to its original level of $500 per week. We opposed the cut this summer to $300 a week and we were critical of the government not only for simply ending the CERB and doing it with only two days' notice, Mr. Speaker, but also by uh, choosing not to use the option that they had to extend the CRB until November 20th. Just by regulation, by a wave of their hand, they could have allowed for another month of support for the almost 900,000 people who were still availing themselves of the financial help under the Canada recovery benefit. They chose not to do that. 
that still would have meant that the benefits only lasted until a couple days before we are assembled here to talk about next steps. <clears throat> we know that the cost of living never went down, in fact, quite the contrary, which is why it didn't make sense to reduce the benefit. It was at $2,000 a month. The cost that people were facing for housing, for food, for home heating and other things went up and the Liberals thought it was time to bring the benefit down, leaving one to wonder how you're supposed to pay more for the essentials with less money in your pocket. One has to assume it was a simple attempt to starve people back to work, make sure that they don't have enough from the benefit and maybe they'll rejoin the job market. And when reducing the benefit to $300 a week didn't work, they decided to cancel it altogether. The problem is, as I mentioned before, the people who need a job are not the people that employers are looking for, or they would be employed. It's already been a month, Mr. Speaker, since there has been no CERB support. No one has received CERB support for the last month, and yet we haven't heard from employers that suddenly they're able to hire the people that they need and want to hire in their business. That's because there are other factors driving the labor shortage. Consider, Mr. Speaker, that there are many people who work in industries that have yet to bounce back. Jobs aren't necessarily available in the sector that they have the experience and the training in, which can make it hard to find work. Consider that many people who are already close to retirement, Mr. Speaker, got to see what retirement life would be like, either by working a bit from home or because they were laid off for a while during the pandemic, and either to protect their personal health or just because they found that they could actually get by and they liked retirement life, and it was their time to, to do that. They'd worked hard all their life and now it was time to take their retirement. They chose not to go back to work. There may be more early retirements as more workers are called back to the workplace and employers begin to end work from home mandates. If the Liberals were serious about having the backs of workers until the end of the pandemic, they'd be working with employers to identify the jobs they need to fill and inventory the skills needed for those positions and then train people off of the pandemic benefits into the jobs that are available, instead of simply cutting the benefit. Instead, they chose to reduce and then terminate that benefit and financial support that could have made it easier for people to pursue the education and training that they need to get that job. This mean-spirited and ill-conceived approach to wrapping up pandemic benefits does not bode well for the promised reforms to the employment insurance system, because those reforms have to be about financially supporting people while they get the education and training they need to fill the positions that are available in the labour market. The Liberals have an had an opportunity to do that now with pandemic benefits. They've failed to do that and we have to worry that the same failure will plague the reform of the employment insurance system, which I have to say, Mr. Speaker, they're sure taking their sweet time on. We know that we've known for a long time that there are structural problems with the employment insurance system and we haven't seen the Liberals act quickly in order to rectify those. I think it's worth noting also, Mr. Speaker, we talk about the cost of these pandemic uh, programs and, and what, what fails to get mentioned in all of that is that at the peak of the CERB and CRB, there were about 9 million Canadians who were availing themselves of those programs. When the program was cut, there were less than 900,000 people on those programs which means that's over a 90% reduction in demand for the program, which means a 90% or more cut in the cost of the program, and that's before you even consider that the Liberals cut the amount of the benefit by 40%. So the ongoing cost of maintaining CERB for another six months or 12 months is significantly less than what we've already paid out in CERB spending, Mr. Speaker. But even if we accept for the sake of argument that it's time to pivot, as the Deputy Prime Minister has said, it is time, the targeted approach that they're taking fails by its own light, Mr. Speaker. So I want to take, for example, the tourism and the hospitality sector. Their targeted program is based on the wage subsidy program, a program that's only going to work for workers who are employed by somebody else when many people like independent travel agents are actually self-employed. It's no small amount of people in that industry, Mr. Speaker. About half the independent travel agents uh, fall into the category of self-employed. There's about 80 or 90,000 
that are represented by the Independent Travel Advisors Association. So we're talking about 40 to 45,000 people. Those, those are some of the 800 and some thousand who were still on the CRB. That's in an industry that's composed of about 85% women. So a government that likes to pride itself on gender analysis of its policies, I think, clearly hasn't done its homework here. And there is a gendered impact on the failure to extend a benefit like the CRB. Because they're going to have no income support under this. And earlier, we spoke about the arts and culture sector. And we know well that there are many freelance workers in that industry too. And they will not receive financial support because they are independent workers. And because there is no longer any financial support system in place, like the CERB that sent direct payments to individuals. So if the person does not have an employer, they have no way to receive financial support. C2 also ignores the opportunity to address problems with the, with the uh, Canada Emergency Business Account, where we've heard from many, many small businesses. The businesses that clearly needed the support the most that the one-year repayment deadline uh, in order to uh, enjoy the forgivable loan portion of that program uh, is just simply unrealistic because they continue to be in serious uh, economic trouble. So let's talk about the Canada Worker Lockdown Benefit, Mr. Speaker, again, and we just heard, I just asked the Associate Minister of Finance earlier today, um, <laughs> They like to vaunt that, well, it's going to be retroactive to October 23rd, so it's okay that we cut the CRB with only two days' notice for the people who were still on it. But the Associate Minister of Finance confirmed earlier today that actually no region in Canada mm -hmm. meets the criteria for the Canada worker lockdown benefit so far. So the fact that it's retroactive to October 23rd is completely meaningless. Yep. It won't help anyone because there is no region that meets the criteria in the legislation to date. Maybe down the road, maybe up to May 7th, and that is the cutoff for the Canada Worker Lockdown Benefit, which is interesting because the other provisions actually allow the government by order and council to extend those provisions to the end of June, beginning of July. There is no such provision for the Canada work, lo Worker Lockdown Benefit. That will end in May, short of another legislative intervention. So when it came to the CRB, they decided not to extend the benefits through October and November, they extended the other programs that they could. They chose not to do that for the CRB. And when it comes to the CRB's replacement program, they've created a program that doesn't cover the time between October 23rd and now. And they've chosen not to give themselves the option to extend that program past May 7th. You have to wonder what workers have done to this government to make them uh, feel such a strong sense of retribution. And this is just part of why this bill really fails to uh, take us in the direction that we have to go, and I think it's going to fail to address some of the immediate economic problems that we have, like the labor shortage that employers are so keen to solve. It would actually take a government showing leadership, working with employers and employees or workers who are out of a job in order to figure out how to match their skills to the jobs that are available. But these, Mr. Speaker, are just some of the problems with the bill as written. In fact, what's worse are the emissions from the bill, Mr. Speaker. They've failed to take the opportunity to implement a low-income CERB repayment amnesty. We know there are a lot of people who are already poor who took the government at its word when they said, look, if you need help, go ahead, apply for help. If you have doubts about whether you're eligible for the help that we've created, apply. We'll figure it out later. You won't be punished. You won't be persecuted. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think of the kids who aged out of foster care in Manitoba during the pandemic. They went to the provincial government because there were no jobs available in the summer of 2020. Let's not kid ourselves. It wasn't like there were a bunch of jobs on the market that they could have walked into. And the provincial government said, you can't apply here until you've applied for every other avenue of help. By the way, here's the website for, for the CERB. You go and you apply there. That was a no-fail application process. So of course those kids were going to succeed and they were going to receive CERB money. And they did. Now the federal government is asking that they pay that back. 
well, the, the province sure as hell isn't going to give them retroactive social assistance payments to cover the period that they missed because they applied for this federal program. And instead of showing some compassion, this government is chasing them down for the money, money that they don't have. And what is that going to do? It's going to make it harder for them to get a proper start in life because they're already starting from behind, Mr. Speaker. And that's why we need to see a low-income CERB repayment amnesty in Canada now. I think of George from my riding, who is on the GIS. He applied for the CERB because he lost some employment income. Turns out he just didn't meet the $5,000 qualifying threshold for income. He just missed it. So they've asked for that money back. Now, George filed properly. He paid his taxes on that money, so he never got the gross amount because he paid the net amount. They want the gross amount back. And, Mr. Speaker, on top of that, they've counted that income from CERB that they're demanding back in the eligibility calculation for his guaranteed income supplement. So he's had his guaranteed income supplement cut by $750 a month. Well, they asked for the gross amount back that they paid him in CERB when all he got was the net, and his normal income has been shredded by the government's uncompassionate approach to the GIS and their failure so far Absolutely. to fix this problem that is affecting up to 88,000 seniors across the country, Mr. Speaker. And I want to talk about these clawbacks a little bit too. Again, people were told, if you need help, get the help. Take the help. We're here for you. We got your back. We got your back to the end of the pandemic. Well, seniors who were working to top up their GIS, Mr. Speaker, took them at their word. They took them at their word. And what they found out this July was that they weren't getting a pandemic benefit. They were getting an advance on their guaranteed income supplement for the next year, except they weren't told that that's what it was. So they didn't bank the money. We know of some people who finally got dental work done problems in their mouth that have been causing them pain and plaguing them for years. They couldn't afford to fix it because we don't have any kind of national dental strategy, which is an issue for another day, but I'm happy to talk about, and it's something that the federal government should get moving on. So they use some of that money to fix their teeth. Sometimes they use some of that money to fix their car, which is how they get to work. They used it to pay off bills that they hadn't been able to pay off and that the interest was piling up on, Mr. Speaker. These people didn't misuse the funds. But it turns out they were spending tomorrow's paycheck without knowing it because the government didn't bother to tell them. And there have been recent media reports that show the government knew about this problem at least as early as May of this year. Now, the GIS reassessment happened in July. Why the government couldn't be bothered, at least, to issue a letter to let people know so that they could begin to develop a strategy, I don't know. I think it's shameful, and I think the government has a real obligation to let them know. I have to say, Mr. Speaker, I was a little shocked this week. I heard the Minister for Employment and Workforce Development in response to a media question on this very point say, and I quote from the press conference, Mr. Speaker, it's a more complicated issue than one would think because there's a, a serious kind of fairness and equity issues for people who may have earned similar amounts in employment income. If a senior worked last year and made an equivalent amount, they too would have lost their GIS or had their GIS potentially reduced. And so we're working on a path forward that recognizes this. Interesting, Mr. Speaker, because they have no concept of equity and fairness when it comes to the largest corporations. Only when it comes to the poor are they willing to nickel and dime. But let's talk about the Canada Wage Subsidy Program and quote from the good work of the Globe and Mail on this issue from May 10th, 2021. Beyond a handful of hedge funds, some of the largest wealth managers in the country Household names such as Franklin Templeton, CI Financial, Gluskin Chef and Associates collected the wage subsidy. Collectively, these three companies manage close to $110 billion, $110 billion of assets in Canada. The Scotiabank Hedge Fund Index, which measures the monthly performance of Canadian domiciled hedge funds with assets under management of at least $15 million, shows an average return of 11% in 2020, the best year for the industry in a decade. Another wage subsidy resist, uh, recipient was the hedge fund GM Fund Management. Its GM Catalyst Fund had such a good 2020 with outsized returns not seen by the fund since 2016 that it was ranked as the third best performing hedge fund at the 2020 Canadian Heritage Fund Awards. Well, Mr. Speaker, where's the concern for equity and fairness there? Companies who had competitors who didn't take the wage subsidy aren't being asked to pay any of that back, and they walked off with tens of millions of dollars. Yeah. But God forbid that somebody who's poor 
got an extra couple thousand dollars to fix their car or fix their teeth or pay off a late bill. And that's why I think this bill gets up gets us off on the exact wrong foot for the pandemic recovery because that should be about making sure that the people at the top are paying for the recovery and the people at the bottom are getting the help they receive and this is not what we're doing with this bill. Here, here. A Questions and comments? For Peace River Westlock. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I know I thank the Honourable Member for his uh, amazing speech. Laying out, laying out the intricacies of the Canadian uh, economy, laying out the intricacies of the average Canadian's everyday life uh, and the fact that it takes a steady hand and it takes something, it takes a diligent government to ensure that they're not having unintended consequences. And so now we see a job market of a million jobs. There's a million empty jobs in this country, a million jobs looking for a person uh, because of the actions of these government. We see out of a control inflation. What do you, I don't see anything in this bill that would helps to fill those one million jobs. I'm just wondering what the Honourable Member, if he, if he sees anything in this bill that would help to alleviate the jobs crisis we have in this country. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Honourable Member for Elmwood Transcona. Well, as I say, I mean, the CRB has been done for a month already. I think it's pretty clear to, to anyone who is paying attention that there will be no financial help for any of the people that were collecting the CRB. It will only continue for those who were receiving their help through, through the wage subsidy, a program where we know in some cases, like in Alberta, had actually been used to fund scab labour while uh, workers were actually locked out. And so, uh, no, I mean, this isn't going to do anything for the labour market because contrary to the claims of Conservatives that I've heard many times, it wasn't the pandemic benefits that were causing the problems in the labour market. There's a lot going on in the labour market. We had a labour shortage before the pandemic. Yeah. And so if the people who were receiving these benefits are going to help with the labour shortage, there's clearly a need for education and training so that their skills are suitable for what employers are looking for. That's a training mandate. It's the kind of training mandate that got cut out of, un uh, of employment insurance, then unemployment insurance, by the Liberals in the 90s and was never put back in. And it's the kind of thing that has to be part of employment insurance reform going forward. This doesn't give me a lot of confidence that this government understands that. Yeah, awesome. Question A, come on. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for St. Jean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank my colleague for his excellent speech. At the Bloc, we share the same worry regarding the um, guaranteed income supplement cuts for seniors. It's not necessary to go through a bill to correct the situation. Since August, it was possible to consider the CERB uh, differently, no longer as, as um, the same type of uh, benefit. Does my honourable colleague agree with me without having to go through a bill? The, Elmwood. the member for Elmwood Transcona. Thank you to my colleague for her question. We have repeatedly asked the government since the election and even before how and what do they need to correct this situation? And we asked, was it necessary to have a bill to rectify the situation? They refused to give a clear answer. In my experience, that means that, no, they do not need a bill to ensure seniors receive their benefit. So this was something that they could have corrected in August, and they decided to wait. And we know there are seniors experiencing homelessness because of that decision. It is an emergency. And that is why I asked permission for an emergency debate Wednesday in the House, because we know it is an emergency situation for those seniors. It is possible for the government to do this. There are a number of mechanisms to enable it, but it's a question of will, and we want to create that will here in the House now that we're together. And comments, the Honourable Member for Winnipeg North. 
Yes, so thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you know, I listened to the member from Elmwood, and he tries to give this false impression, an impression that couldn't be further from the truth. That is that the government doesn't understand or doesn't care. You know, when the pandemic hit, this government came to the table. We created a program from nothing called CERB. We supported wage subsidy uh, programs, uh, business uh, rent subsidies. We gave direct payments to seniors, direct payments to uh, people with disability. This government understood the need, still understands the need. This legislation in principle extends the benefits that thousands of Canadians will benefit. My question to the member, will the NDP do the right thing and recognize the principle of this bill, continues the supports that Canadians need today, and get behind and vote for this legislation? The Honourable Member before Elmwood Transcona. This bill does not extend benefits, it restricts benefits. That much is very clear. And if the Liberals care to wit, and I hope they do, at the next Cabinet meeting on Tuesday, they can solve the problem of the GIS for yep. seniors, and they could fix the problem of the Canada Child Benefit for all the low-income families that are also experiencing a clawback. Companies on the wage subsidy got a handout from the uh, government. Some of them, they didn't need it. They hasn't been asked for back. And, and the poorest of the poor, it turns out, actually just got an advance without being told that it was an advance on their financial support. So if they care, they should fix it. Nobody, doesn't matter how hard they care, they can sit around and have a caring circle, doesn't do anything for anyone. What we need is a fix, so get on it. Question a come on to Questions and comments? Honourable member for Cowichan, Malahat, Langford. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I want to thank the member for Elmwood Transcona for an excellent speech and once again demonstrating why he is such a valued member of this caucus. You know, what we are seeing here is an extreme case of compassion fatigue from this government. I mean, to my Liberal colleagues, like, have they just lost the ability to care? Is, are they just done? Have they run out? We live in a strange time, Mr. Speaker. I've never seen so many help wanted signs in my riding. But like the member for Elmwood Transcona said, it, those jobs have not filled up corresponding with the end of CERB benefits a month ago. There, there is no correlation. And, and to, to, to the narrative where people think that workers who are re receiving CERB were living high on the hog, let me remind this House that the $2,000 a month equals about a little over $12 an hour. I mean, those aren't wages that families can get by on. So I'm just wondering if, if my colleague can expand uh, on that theme that, that you know, these benefits were really just holding the line and that we still have too many people in this country who are the working poor who cannot advance because of all of the costs that they are facing. Honourable Member for Elmwood Transcona. One of the things that we know, Mr. Speaker, is that well over half of the people who were still on the Canada uh, recovery benefit when it was terminated prior to the pandemic were making uh, far less than $20,000 a year. So that means they were already either in low paying jobs or that they were working part time. That's not necessarily the kinds of jobs that employers are trying to fill right now. So there's an obvious mismatch between who's available to work and the kinds of jobs that are available. And the question is, if people have no financial support, how are they supposed to pursue the education and training that they need in order to fill those jobs. When their families are in crisis and they're trying to figure out where they're going to get their next meal or trying to figure out where to sleep if they've been evicted from their home. That's not how you train the workforce for tomorrow. It's not uh, the law of the jungle and everybody fend for themselves. If we, if we actually want to respond to the needs of employers, we need to have a plan and it needs to be resourced. That's good for workers and it's good for employers, but it's not what the government is doing. So I call on them to get with the program and figure it out. They're going to have to figure it out because it's the kind of model we're going to need for employment insurance. Questions and comments? Uh, the Honourable Member for Northumberland and Peterborough South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You're doing a fantastic job. Um, there's, no, there's no doubt in that, uh, in that the NDP and the Conservative Party have different theories on, on politics and on economics. But I'm wondering if the member shares my thoughts that if we hadn't gone to a needless, useless election, that the NDP, the Liberal Party, and the Conservatives could have sat down and started to figure some of this out. Honourable Member for Elmwood Transcona, a minute to go. 
Well, there's, there certainly is no question that we shouldn't have had an election when we did. There was no reason for the election. There was actually an all-party recommendation out of the Procedure and House Affairs Committee after they studied the question of a pandemic election that recommended against having an election unless the government lost a confidence vote in the House, which they never did. And there was a fixed election date law on the book that said that there shouldn't have been an election unless the government lost the confidence of the House, which it didn't. So there is absolutely no question that we should not have had that election. I, I, that thought occurred to me a few times in the debate yesterday when I heard Liberals saying, and it, as it happens, you know, we do support having a hybrid capability because we recognize we're not out of the pandemic. But it was hard to fit the Liberals' arguments about why it was okay to have an election with why we need a hybrid parliament. That's their contradiction, not ours. Yeah.